Well, good morning to all of you and welcome back. It's great to be with you. And wow, what a wonderful worship time that was. Fantastic. I think uh, we Presbyterians have a lot to learn from you Baptists on that score. In fact, Dr. Allen might be right. I might just be a Baptist before I leave here and go back home. But it's been a delightful time here. It really has. Not only was it enjoyable to be with you yesterday for the first of these two lectures, but I've been busy in other places throughout uh, the campus. Yesterday, I did two different podcasts, also did a video interview, then did an interview with Dr. Allen, and then sat in on Dr. Kostenberger's class. Um, it was a full day, but a great day, and I'm just so blessed to be here with you at Midwestern and just really enjoyed meeting some students and, of course, seeing faculty I know and meeting new ones. It's been a delightful time with you. And I'm looking forward now to, as we turn our attention to this uh, second lecture of two, and as, of course, as you know, the theme this week thus far has been this theme of the relationship between inspiration and the formation of the New Testament canon. And I've been trying to recover a degree of focus on something that most scholars don't want to talk about and that most scholars have overlooked, and that is what role the internal aesthetic qualities of Scripture might have played in its reception within early Christianity. And to put it succinctly, we've been asking the question of whether a book's acceptance or rejection in early Christianity was related at all to its perceived inspiration. Did Christians accept some books because they were inspired and reject other books because they were not? Well, for you and I, as I mentioned yesterday, that seems like an obvious uh, question with an obvious answer. And we would say, of course. But as you know, now that you've heard the first lecture, not all scholars agree. In fact, as we discussed yesterday, a number of scholars starting with Everett Kalin and now in the modern day, Lee McDonald, Craig Allert, and others have argued that no, inspiration was not a distinctive quality that only the scriptures enjoyed, but that everything, or not everything, but many things in early Christianity were inspired, including the church fathers, their writings, declarations of church councils, and so on. So yesterday in my first lecture, if you were here, I worked hard to rebut that claim, and we culled through a number of patristic sources together, and we observed that while it's true, Inspiration language, inspiration language of a sort is used for all kinds of sources. We argued there's very good reasons to think the church fathers did not always use it in the same way. In other words, similar terminology does not mean similar concepts. In fact, we concluded yesterday with this understanding that there is a distinctive, higher, unique type of inspiration that's true of Scripture and Scripture alone. And so yesterday, in some sense, was sort of a deck-clearing exercise, which now sets us up for today. If it's true that Scripture enjoys a distinctive kind of inspiration that is not true of other sources and not true of the church fathers, then now we can sort of ask again the question of whether that inspiration might have played a role in whether books were accepted or rejected. But of course, that just raises yet another foundational question, and that is the one we'll turn to today. How did early Christians think such inspiration could be identified. Even if you say that inspiration was a way to know a book belonged in the canon, that just raises the question of how you know whether a book's inspired. Did, did church fathers think you could know such a thing? Now, of course, that's not a question just for them. That's a question for us, right? I mean, isn't that the question that you have in your head sometimes? And isn't that the question your non-Christian friends ask? I mean, you look at the Bible and you say it's inspired. How do you know? Is there a way to determine whether a book is from God or not? Well, the church fathers certainly had their own answers to those questions. But when we ask the question of whether you could look at a book and know it's inspired, most modern scholars are skeptical. James Barr famously said it this way, quote, books do not necessarily say whether they are divinely inspired or not. In other words, there's no tag attached to them that says this one's inspired and not others. So according to Barr, at least you can't know. Of course, he's partly right. It's not as if there's tags attached to books. Not every book makes a claim about itself in a very obvious, direct way. But apparently, at least in the mind of the church fathers, as we'll see momentarily, you could know whether a book was inspired. Now, of course, one way the church fathers say you could know a book was inspired was something we hinted at yesterday, is that if you knew a book was apostolic, if you did some historical work and uncovered that it's an apostolic book and comes from an apostle and the teachings come from an apostle, then you could conclude that book's inspired because the apostolic office had the authority to speak for God. Okay, fair enough. That's one way to know 
whether a book is inspired. If you did a little bit of historical investigation or had historical information, you could determine a book came from an apostle. Okay, well, then you could know a book was inspired in that way. And of course, that reminds us that apostolicity, inspiration, they go together, right? They're kind of two sides of the same coin. If you have a book that's apostolic, well, then it's inspired. And if you have an inspired book, well, then it has to have been written by someone who was inspired, which means from an apostle. But there's still the lingering question, though, of whether there's a way to identify a book is inspired without knowing its authorship. Or to put it yet another way, did early Christians think they could apprehend a book's inspiration directly? Did they think there was a way to know by looking at a book whether it was divine, whether it was from God? I don't imagine that most of us maybe have ever asked the question that way. Maybe we've never really thought about it. Most of us, when we think about how we know a book's from God, we, we tend to go down the route of historical evidences. And, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. I've spent a good bit of my career working through historical evidences. I think that very much plays a role in how we know. But is that the only way you know? Church fathers have offered, and I will argue too that the Reformers offered, a different way and maybe a more foundational way. They argued you could actually know a book is from God as strange as it sounds, from the book itself. So let's turn our attention then to this theme of self-authentication of books within early Christianity. Although most studies on the canon offer little discussion of the role played by the internal aesthetic qualities of books, something we talked about yesterday, there's a remarkable quote by Bruce Metzger in his book on the canon of the New Testament that is often overlooked. In fact, it's tucked away in the back And if you've ever slogged your way through Metzger's book on canon, you know by the time you get there, you're exhausted anyway and probably don't have the energy to read it. But this book is remarkably important for, or this quote's remarkably important for our point here. Listen to the words of Bruce Metzger. He says this. During the second and succeeding centuries, the authoritative word was found not in the utterances of contemporary leaders and teachers, but in the apostolic testimony contained within certain early Christian writings. Okay, thus far in Metzger's quote, we proved that yesterday, right? That the authoritative word of God is not in the church leaders, but in the apostolic writings, and Metzger agrees. But then he goes on to say this, and this is key. From this point of view, the church did not create the canon, but came to recognize, accept, affirm, and confirm the self-authenticating quality of certain documents that impose themselves as such on the church. Let me repeat that last part again. The church did not create the canon, but came to recognize, accept, affirm, and confirm the self-authenticating quality of certain documents that impose themselves as such on the church. Now, in this remarkable quote, Metzger here affirms that early Christians believed that apostolic books were what he calls, and what theologians since have called, self-authenticating meaning they had certain qualities about them that revealed their divine character. It's not so much, and and this is important to understand, it's not so much that a book claims to be divine, although many do. It's not so much that, but they evidence themselves to be divine by their internal qualities. In fact, Metzger is so convinced these qualities are there within these early books, he's able to say that it's not so much that the church chose the books, but that the the books impose themselves on the church. And by the way, that's a paradigm shift I hope you'll catch today, and it's a complete flip-flopping of the normal narrative. The normal narrative is, well, the the church wanted to create a canon, and they went out to find books, and they chose the books they wanted, and so it's all about the church. But Metzger's saying, no, 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 if it's self-authenticating, then it's actually not about the church. The church is simply responding to and reacting to what was already true and already there, namely, the quality these books already possessed. In other words, the church is a responder, not a creator. Now, once you have that idea in your head, we have to ask the question, is that true? Did the church fathers think this way? Well, following Metzger, Charles Hill has shown that, in fact, they did think this way. In fact, in a recent article, he argues that often when the church fathers sought to demonstrate the inspiration and divinity of Scripture, they often appealed to Scripture itself as its own greatest proof. Now, again, this is not to suggest that the church fathers nor us can't do or can't show the divinity of Scripture in other ways, and we can. And again, I already hinted that I've worked in my own career at dealing with historical evidences as part of this answer. 
But what's noteworthy is that for the church fathers, not, that's not necessarily the first place they went. They had this idea that Scripture was, in some sense, its own greatest witness. Let's look at a few examples patristically that show this, and I'll just go through a number that demonstrate that this was the idea in the minds of the church fathers. We begin with Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr, of course, mentions in his works an unnamed mentor, what he calls an old man who told him about the gospel and what led to his conversion. And at one point, Justin describes what this old man taught about the Bible. And he says to us that the old man said that the Bible contains a message that is, quote, a truth above all demonstration, and therefore worthy of belief. In other words, in the mind of Justin's mentor, the Bible had the kind of truth that was above demonstration. It was the kind of thing that that you used to demonstrate other truths, rather than the thing that you would demonstrate. It was what we might call a first principle, and we'll come back to that uh, in a moment. Now, for Justin, this did not rule out other sorts of proofs. If you're familiar with Justin Martyr, you know that he was very well known for his fulfillment of prophecy proof for why we know the Bible's the Word of God. But it did simply highlight that in Justin's mind and in his mentor's mind, there's something about Scripture that is somewhat self-attesting in its authority. Similarly, the writer of the second, or century, second century or third century treatise on the resurrection, well, once thought to be by Justin, but we now know probably was not, that same uh, uh, trend line is observed, where that author argues that the word of God, listen to these words, the word of God, quote, carries its own authority, and, quote, should be believed for its own nobility. Third example here of this trend in patristic writers is Clement of Alexandria, Clement was always going out of his way to say that the scripture does not require external proofs, although there are external proofs. And what Clement argued is that scripture functions as a, what he calls a philosophical first principle. Now, in the, in the mind of Clement and in, in philosophical discussions of the day, to, to be a philosophical first principle is something he picks up from Plato and other philosophers. And the idea behind it is there's some truths that are so foundational, so basic, so core, that it's not so much that you prove them by other things, but they are the things by which you prove everything else. That's a starting point. And in some sense, in modern epistemological language, to say the Bible's a first principle is just to say it's our ultimate authority. And anytime you're talking about authenticating an ultimate authority, well, you can do nothing other than authenticate it by itself, because if you tried to authenticate an ultimate authority by some other authority, you've just shown it's not really ultimate. It has to be the ultimate starting point in first principle, says Clement. So he goes on to say this. Those who have faith to, quote, hear the voice of God in the scriptures, those folks find that they have a, quote, demonstration of its divinity that cannot be impugned. And elsewhere he says this, quote, the voice of the Lord, implicitly in the scriptures, is the surest of all demonstrations, unquote. It's no surprise, therefore, that Clement's disciple, Origen, embraced a very similar approach. In fact, I want you to hear this quote by Origen. This may capture this mentality amongst the church fathers better than about any other statement I know of. It's really remarkable when you hear it. This is what Origen says. If anyone ponders over the prophetic sayings, which by that he means scripture, if anyone ponders over the prophetic sayings, it is certain that in the very act of reading and diligently studying them, his mind and feelings will be touched by a divine breath, and he will recognize the words he is reading are not utterances of man, but the language of God. Let me read that again. It's a remarkable quote. If anyone ponders over the prophetic sayings, it is certain that in the very act of reading and diligently studying them, his mind and feelings will be touched by a divine breath, and he will recognize the words he is reading are not the utterances of man, but the language of of God. In other words, in Origen's mind, which is the same as Clement, which is the same as Justin, if you were to read the Bible and apprehend it directly, that you will see intuitively that this is a word that comes not from men, but from God. In fact, elsewhere, Origen says something very similar. He says, the Old Testament prophets, referring again to the Old Testament, which he would also say is true of the New Testament, he says, those Old Testament prophets, quote, are sufficient to produce faith in anyone who reads them. And thereby, he says, the gospel similarly offer a, quote, demonstration of its own in the same fashion. What you see in all those citations, and that's a sampling there, is that there's this idea within early patristic writings that there's something about the scripture that is 
above all demonstration, that it is a first principle, that it's its own greatest proof, and that you can apprehend its divinity in some sense by looking at Scripture directly. Now, as soon as you recognize that principle is there in the church fathers, a corollary follows, and it's not surprising. The corollary that follows is that if Scripture works that way, then the only way someone can apprehend those qualities and thereby apprehend that Scripture is inspired is if they have the help of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's help is necessary for a person to see Scripture for what it is. And so if we return to some of these same authors, we see that they don't just say the Scripture is its own best demonstration, but then they follow it quickly with, and you need the Spirit's help to see this. Returning to Justin Martyr, again, after his mentor told him, look, the Scripture is the truth above all demonstration, that same mentor went on to say that you can only recognize that with God's help. He says, quote, but pray that above all things, the gates of light may be open to you, for these things cannot be perceived or understood by all, but only by the man to whom God and his Christ have imparted wisdom. Similarly, Clement of Alexandria, he argues that people, as we've already seen, perceive the truth of God's word by its own qualities, but he draws a curious illustration of this. His illustration is that you, dis you discern the truth of God's word from false things in the same way a money changer knows that a, there's a true coin versus a counterfeit coin. So in this illustration, he says, well, you know how money changers, they can tell a counterfeit coin when they see it by apprehending it directly. And then Clement goes on to say, though, that you can only apprehend counterfeit coins, so to speak, directly, if you have, quote, a new eye, a new ear, and a new heart. Origin also indicates that you have to have the help of the Holy Spirit. In fact, as we already read in the quote a moment ago, he says, when you apprehend the scriptures are from God, it's because you are, quote, touched by a divine breath, which is no doubt an indication of his view that the Holy Spirit is at work. Moreover, Origen goes on to argue that this is exactly how the Old Testament Jews discerned false prophets from true prophets in the Old Testament times. How did they do this? Because Origen refers to, quote, the gift of the discernment of the spirits. In other words, you have to have the spirit helping you discern false prophets things from true things. Even beyond these authors, we see the same thing come up in Eusebius. Eusebius talks about the Old Testament times with the Hebrew people, and he says that they, quote, approved what was rightly said or written. Listen to that for a moment. They approved what was rightly said or written with help from the Holy Spirit. And the contrary they rejected, just as they rejected the words of the false prophets. Now, all of that first point here is a simple one, although it may be new to some of you, which is this idea that it, if you ask the question, how do we know a book is from God? Lots of ways to know that, but one of the main ways to know that, at least according to the patristic writers, is by apprehending that book directly because it's its own self-evident truth. It's its own highest demonstration, and you need the Holy Spirit in order to see those things. In other words, there's some qualities about the Bible that show they're from God. But of course, that just leads to a second question, uh, this morning, and that is, okay, if the scriptures have these internal qualities that show that it's from God and you can determine it's inspired by looking at it directly, what are these qualities? It's one thing to say there's qualities. It's one thing to say there's marks or indications. It's another thing to, to sort of articulate what those are. Do the church fathers ever say what it actually is about the biblical books that show they're inspired? Well, actually they do. So this leads us to a second consideration this morning. Now that we've laid out the paradigm of the church fathers, we turn our attention to what these internal qualities actually are. Now, in my own sort of culling through the patristic sources, I've identified three different categories here of qualities of Scripture. Maybe there's more, and certainly and maybe in your own studies, and I would certainly appeal to the faculty here who've done their own great work in patristic sources. If there's others, there certainly might be. But let me just mention three that we see very plainly in these patristic writings. First, the beauty and excellency of Scripture. The beauty and excellency of Scripture. Common among the fathers is that the Scripture reveals its own divinity by the excellency or beauty of its teachings. Illustrative in this regard is actually the philosopher Tatian. Now, if you know Tatian's story, he was a pagan philosopher who converted to Christianity it's actually a remarkable story, and when he converted to Christianity, he ended up penning what would came to be known as the Dia Tesseron, which is the harmony of the four Gospels, and that's really what made him famous. But Tatian is also famous for this remarkable conversion, and he actually gives this conversion story. 
In fact, he tells us in this story that he was on a quest to, quote, discover the truth. And he, and he actually tells us how he came to believe that Scripture was divine. And this is what he says. I was led to put faith in these Scriptures by the unpretending cast of the language, the inartificial character of the writers, the foreknowledge displayed of future events, the excellent quality of the precepts, and my soul being taught of God, I discern that the former class of pagan writings led to condemnation, but that these scriptures put an end to the slavery that is in the world. And by that, he means spiritual slavery. In other words, according to Tatian, the way he became converted is by actually reading the Bible and seeing what he calls the excellent quality of the precepts. In fact, remarkably, Tatian even acknowledges that his ability to discern this, that's the word he uses, is because he was, quote, taught of God. Clement of Alexandria affirms this same reality of the beauty and excellency of God's word and the impact it makes on the reader. He refers to the scriptures as God's divine letters, and he says you can distinguish them from human writings because, quote, no one will be so impressed by the exhortations of any of the saints as he is by the words of the Lord himself. Notice there that Clement is talking in contrast to the words of the saints. That should support our point last lecture. But then he said, you're not going to be impacted or impressed by them like you are going to be by the word of God. Read the word of God and you will see that it's something different. Particularly noteworthy on the score is Chrysostom. He argues that you can know God's word is God's word, just like you know good music by listening to it. And this is actually a great illustration that Chrysostom leans on, and other church fathers do as well, is it just like you know, music is wonderful and beautiful and excellent, so it is with the Word of God. In fact, he says about John's gospel in particular this, the words of John's gospel are, quote, sweeter and more delightful than all harmony of music, and with more skill to soothe, and besides all this, most holy and most awful and full of mystery so great. You know who Chrysostom sounds like there? He sounds like the psalmist, does he not? That the word of the Lord is beautiful and wonderful. It's like, it's sweet. It's like honey from the comb. Beautiful to the taste. There's a sense that the church fathers are saying that when you read the Bible, you see the beauty and excellency of Scripture. But there's a second characteristic they also mention. Not just the beauty of Scripture, but secondly, the power of Scripture what you might call the efficacy of Scripture. In other words, patristic authors also indicate that the divinity of Scripture can be ascertained not only by what it says, by what it does. The Scriptures do things. To you as the reader or the listener, they do things because they are part of God's own divine power being revealed. In other words, the power of Scripture reveals its inspiration. On this score, we think of the Apology of Aristides. The Apology of Aristides, interestingly, was actually written to the emperor. And in this interesting apology, he's trying to convince the emperor of the truth of Christianity. And he actually encourages the emperor to, quote, read the gospel, which no doubt implies that there's a gospel text. This is an interesting side note. And a gospel text that the emperor himself might actually have access to, which is curious. But he tells the emperor, you should read the gospel. Why? And he says this, because... You will also, if you read therein, will perceive the power which belongs to it. In other words, what you see when you read the gospel is the power of the words therein. Justin Martyr makes a similar argument. He tries to persuade Trypho the Jew in his very famous dialogue with Trypho of the truth of Jesus' words that are found in what he calls the memoirs of the apostles, the, the gospels. In order to make his case, he says this about those words in the gospels, quote, for they possess a terrible power in themselves and are sufficient to inspire those who turn aside from the path of rectitude with awe, while the sweetest rest is afforded those who make a diligent practice of them. In other words, seeing the word, reading the word, the word does things, has a terrible power in them, and it gives you rest when you follow them. And again, Justin says elsewhere this. He says, quote, I shall prove to you as you stand here, that we have not believed empty fables or words without any foundation, and then he says this, but we have believed words filled with the Spirit of God and big with power and flourishing with grace. I think the most noteworthy example, though, of this 
idea that the power of Scripture is one of its divine attributes is one of the illustrations that Clement of Alexandria gives. And this is actually one I stumbled on in my own research just recently, and I'd never noticed before. But Clement uses an illustration about how you come to believe the Bible is the Word of God from the story of the sirens. Now, of course, that's a mythical story, and Clement isn't saying it's true or that he believes it. He's just using it as an illustration. You know the story of the sirens, that these mythical sea creatures that sing, and when they sing, they draw you in to themselves. He says that's the way Scripture works as an illustration. And here's what Clement says. The songs of the sirens displayed a power that was more than human, that fascinated those who came near and convinced them almost against their will to accept what was said. Now think about the point Clement's making there. He's saying that's the way scriptures work. You could almost substitute scripture in this. It has a power that's more than human. It it fascinates those who come near and convinces them almost against their will to accept what was said. In other words, what, what Clement's point is, is that it's the power of Scripture that draws you in and convinces you that God's Word is, in fact, God's Word. But there's actually a third quality here that comes up in the patristic writings, not just the beauty of Scripture or the power of Scripture, but the third one, and this is actually the big one. And this is the one they actually use the most, is an appeal to what we might call the unity of Scripture or the harmony of Scripture. Patristic writers mention this often, and they often say things like, a book from God is the kind of book that is unified or harmonious. And they mean that in two ways. One is they mean harmonious with itself. That is, it doesn't contradict contradict itself, right? But they also mean unified with prior revelation, which is what we would mean when we say a book is orthodox. It fits with prior revelation. So, What marks out a book as divine? Well, it has to be unified both within itself and with prior revelation. That's, in fact, what a divine book is is marked by, is that kind of internal harmony, unity, and consistency. What you and I might refer to in a strange way, and strange for modern scholars to hear, but not strange for us, is the Scripture's inerrancy. This is all over the patristic sources, so much so that I'm only only going to mention a couple of sample here, but you know it well, that the scriptures in the minds of the patristic writers are always being referred to as unified, perfect, and consistent as evidence of their divine origins. A few examples. First, Clement. This is remarkably early. This is even first century, probably about 95, 96 AD. Clement writes, you have gazed into the holy and true scriptures that were given by the Holy Spirit. And you realize there's nothing unjust or counterfeit written in them. And the word unjust here is unfortunate. It's really better rendered untrue. Nothing untrue or counterfeit written in them. In other words, in in Clement's mind, if you have a book by the Holy Spirit, you'll see that it's consistent throughout. Justin Martyr, same principle. Listen to this statement. He says, I'm convinced, I'm entirely convinced that no scripture contradicts another scripture. Irenaeus, no surprise that he would say something like this, all scripture which has been given to us by God shall be found by us perfectly consistent. And through the many diverse utterances of scripture, there shall be heard one harmonious melody. Theophilus of Antioch, no different. He writes, quote, how much more then shall we know the truth who are instructed by the holy prophets who who themselves were possessed by the Holy Spirit of God? And then he says this, on this account, all the prophets spoke harmoniously and in agreement with one another. Final statement here is Tertullian, who's very plain on this. And in regard to the gospels, he says this, and here I, here I might now make my stand and contend that a work ought, to not, ought not to be recognized, which exhibits no consistency. A work ought not to be recognized, which exhibits no consistency. Consistency. Now, these quotes, and there's so many more, are at least suggestive, and I would certainly argue more than suggestive, that the quality of unity and harmony is one of the major identifying marks of a book from God. After all, the early church fathers see that harmony as only possible by the Holy Spirit's help. After all, normal humans make mistakes. Normal humans contradict each other. They certainly don't always get it right. 
If you were to encounter a book, therefore, that, re- that exhibits a remarkable degree of harmony and unity, that's an evidence of its own divine origins. And what's, what's curious is that, is that you and I use this argument now still today. We, we believe that books are inspired by God by virtue of the connections and the links and the harmony, harmony they have with prior revelation. I mean, think about the Gospels for a moment. When you accept the Gospels as divine, you, you recognize all these links, all these connections, they are finishing the Old Testament story. There's one big redemptive historical story that spans Genesis to Revelation and that the books of the New Testament are finishing and continuing and completing that story. How do you, how do you architecturally create that as a mere human being? How do you make all those links? How do you draw all those connections when the Bible is composed of over 40 different authors written over thousands of years and different continents and cultures, and yet they all agree and tell the same story? How can that be? That's evidence it's a divine book, and the church fathers would agree. And notice you get all that, not from doing a bunch of historical investigations. You do all that by reading the Bible. Even so, even though unity and harmony is seen as a way to know that a book is divine, it should be acknowledged that this particular quality is often utilized by the church fathers in a negative way. And what I mean by that, it was normally employed when they discovered a book that lacked unity. It was the lack of unity or the presence of heresy or the presence of contradictions that quickly revealed a book was not inspired. And this was a helpful tool in the hands of the church fathers. In fact, they were always quickly able to point out a book was not from God by simply pointing out how it made errors and how it had mistakes and how it contradicted prior revelation. This is how the church fathers beat back the apocryphal gospels, as they would often show this was the case. So this, this is a fascinating aspect here, that what you have is now a third quality that shows indeed this unity and harmony is a marker of uh, God's own divine authorship. Now, as we draw that point to a close, let me just sum up where we are thus far. We've argued not only that the Bible, the biblical books are the only books that have the kind of inspiration we're talking about, we're also arguing that the church fathers at least thought you could ascertain that, that, that inspiration by direct access to these books through the help of the Holy Spirit, by observing internal qualities in those books. Examples of such qualities include the beauty and excellency of Scripture, the power of Scripture, and the unity and harmony of Scripture. But now we come to it. If all that's true... Should we use the same method as the church fathers? That's the perennial question, right? Should we think like that now? Of course, no one wants to make the argument because the church fathers did it, therefore we have to do it. Of course, that's not our argument. We're always bold into Scripture and Scripture alone, but it at least suggests that there's a methodology they use that we should concern ourselves with, and we'd want to know whether we should still use it today. I might also add, and I think you know this, that this is the methodology that the the reformers used. Particularly Calvin very much relied on the self-authenticating nature of Scripture, but also Owen very much spent a lot of time on the self-authenticating nature of Scripture. It was their primary argument against Roman Catholicism in their day. So now we have a methodology, if you will, or at least a theological framework that not only is true in the patristic writers, but also true in the formers. And then we now come to the modern day and ask, should we think this way now? Well, on that score, I simply observe two of the main objections now to this approach. And there's many objections to this approach that people would have, and certainly modern scholars would have, but I'm just going to mention two here as we think about how it might apply to our modern day. Here's the two most common objections I hear, and certainly would be heard by the reformers as well, and probably even the patristic writers. Objection number one, if this whole approach is true, and scripture really contains these qualities, then why don't more people see them? This is a common objection. It's like, hold on a second. You're saying the scripture has these wonderful qualities that show they're divine. It's objective. It's really there. Well, if it's really there and it's objective, then why is it that so many people reject the Bible? Why is it so many people read the Bible and say, I don't find it beautiful and excellent. I find it silly and ridiculous. I don't find it wonderful and powerful. I find it confusing and odd. I don't see unity and harmony. I see contradictions everywhere. How is it if these qualities are really there that so many secular scholars, so many people, and all my non-Christian friends all think it's rubbish? Ah, but we've already received part of the answer to that question, right? The church fathers anticipated that question, and they actually said, yeah, you're right. You're, you're not going to see it unless you have the help of the Holy Spirit. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit. If you're going to observe divine qualities, if you're going to observe qualities of the Spirit, you have to have the Spirit. 
to observe those divine qualities correctly. So what the fathers would argue is, is that through the fall and through the tainting of sin, men cannot apprehend rightly what the scripture actually is. In other words, to put it differently, the, when, when, when people don't recognize the Bible as the word of God, the problem isn't the Bible. The problem is their ability to perceive. And I think you could say it this way. It's almost like the non-Christian is spiritually tone deaf. They can't hear good music when they, they, they can't identify good music when they hear it because they're, they're, they only hear things off key. One thing that's curious about non-Christians when they approach the Bible, and I don't know if you've ever noticed this, that when they see the Bible as not making sense to them, they always assume the problem isn't with them, but with the Bible. Problem's not me. I, I, I understand the world perfectly fine. I see perfectly fine. I have all my senses are working perfectly fine. I grasp things perfectly fine. The problem is that Bible over there. And so there's always a sense that the problem is never with the non-Christian, but always with the scriptures. But actually, this flips it around. It says, actually, no, the, the, these things are actually there in the Bible, but you, you, you're... you're Tone deaf, you can't hear good music when it's played. I'm actually convinced this musical analogy works. In fact, it doesn't, I can't help but think of the, of, this is exactly the reason the show American Idol stayed on TV for so many years, I'm convinced. Why did people watch American Idol? They didn't watch it, I'm convinced, because they wanted to see good singers. They watched American Idol because they wanted to see bad singers who thought they were good, which is exactly what happens. How many times on the American Idol show would someone audition and sing and the judges would say, that's not on key? And what inevitably is the response of everyone that happens to? They say, no, 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 it was great. It was wonderful. I'm an awesome singer. The problem is you judges. And and you and I, when we watch that, are perpetually entertained by it because we're like, wow, it's amazing how people lack self-perception, right? So it is, though, with the way Scripture works. The non-Christian is perfectly convinced he's singing on key. And he listens to the music of the Bible and goes, I don't hear it. And we're like, yeah, well, you know, the problem isn't the judges. The problem is the singer in this instance. The problem is you do not have ears to hear. Let me mention a second objection that comes up a lot, though. Not just the objection of why don't more people get it, but then a second objection that comes up to the practice of the fathers and, of course, the reformers, which we have not had time to explore, is this. Isn't this whole approach just a form of subjectivism? So the argument goes. You hear this idea that you can apprehend God's word directly from God's word. You think, well, that sounds like the Mormon argument. Isn't the Mormon argument effectively that you know the Book of Mormon is the Book of Mormon because you have the burning in your bosom and, you know, in your chest? You ever had a Mormon come to your door and say, well, you know, that you, you know, you have this experience with the Spirit and you know the Book of Mormon is from God. Isn't that just what the, aren't we making the same mistake? One might object. Ah, but that actually misunderstands the patristic argument here and the argument from the reformers too. Their argument actually is not a form of subjectivism, and here's why. The argument is is that these qualities are objectively really there in Scripture, whether you perceive them or not. Our argument here is not that Scripture is true because we have this experience with the Spirit. That's not the argument that the church fathers are making. The argument is that we believe Scripture is true because of the objective qualities therein, we may not even know that the Spirit's at work. We may not even have any sort of experience with the Spirit. It's the, it's the, it's the Scripture that is the grounds of our, of our belief, not an experience with the Spirit. What Mormons have done is they shifted the grounds off the Book of Mormon onto an experience with the Spirit. That's not what the fathers are doing. They're not shifting the grounds of our belief in Scripture to some experience with the Spirit. It's still on Scripture. It's just the Spirit just helps you see what's really there. And that's why I want you to know that they think these qualities are objectively really there. Not just in our head, not just made up, they're really there. The, book is, the books of the Bible are really this way. It really is wonderful, it really is powerful, it really is excellent, it really is unified. Obviously, you need the help of the Holy Spirit to see it. So, is there a subjective aspect to apprehending these things? Well, of course, anytime a person apprehends something, there's a subjective aspect to it, but by no means would we ever call it subjectivism. Now, those are the two major objections that come up in the modern day to the approach of the fathers and the reformers. So if there is a sense in which we want to adopt this approach, the idea of a self-authenticating scripture, which I think is certainly something that we ought to give deep consideration to, there are several implications on it for our ministries. And so let me conclude this final lecture with drawing out just a few last implications. If in fact the Bible is self-authenticating, I'm convinced this approach is correct, If the Bible is, in fact, self-authenticating, let me mention three implications quickly as we wrap up. First implication, 
A self-authenticating Bible highlights the proper role of the church. The perennial issue for Protestants is how to account for the role of the church in the formation of the canon. The Roman Catholic Church will say, hey, the church made the canon, created the canon, and so on. But if you have a self-authenticating Bible, that shifts the debate entirely. Now it's not true that the church created the canon or made the canon. We would argue rather the church simply recognized what was already true and there about these books. And here we return to what Metzger himself said. There's a sense in which the, the books are imposed upon the church. The church couldn't resist them, if you will. And the church simply recognized what's already there. So the church doesn't create the canon, but is a reactor to the canon, a responder to the canon. And this is a fundamental difference between us and Rome and certainly flows right out of a self-authenticating Bible. One of the things I argue in my writings, therefore, is that the church's or the Protestant view of the church is kind of like the difference between a thermostat and a thermometer. If you go to that little box on your wall in your house and you, you see it there, it's got two things on it. There's a thermometer that tells you the temperature in the room and there's a thermostat that's supposed to create the temperature in the room. The Protestant view of the church is like a thermometer, not a thermostat. We don't create the canon, we don't cause it, we simply re reliably react to what is already there. But you can't have that if you don't have a self-authenticating canon. Second thing by way of implication is that if it's true that the Bible's self-authenticating, then every believer can know the Bibles from God, no matter what their education, no matter what degrees they have, and no matter how much investigations they've done. And this is really important. If we say the only way to know the Bible's from the Word of God is from culling through piles of historical evidences, then what about the people who haven't done that? I guess they just don't know the Bible's the Word of God, and they have to take our word for it, right? Us PhD types, I suppose. Now, make no mistake, I'm not saying again that historical evidences aren't a way to know. I think it is a way to know. I just think it's the only way to know. What you have here is a, a reality that even sort of the person in the pew who never went to college and the, the, the person who never really got an education, the person who's never really investigated any of these things, can they know the Bible's the word of God? Absolutely they can know. Because they have the Bible. And they can read it and they can hear God's voice in it. Every believer can know if you have a self-authenticating Bible. And then thirdly, and finally, and this is where we come to it, if in fact the Bible is self-authenticating, then that might change the way you think is the best way to convince someone the Bible is the word of God. Of course, it's appropriate to do historical evidences with people. Of course, it's appropriate to go into deep background work with people. But if what we're saying here is true, then that means that the best way, or at least a core way that people come to believe the Bible is the word of God is simply by reading it and hearing it. Tatian, remember, the philosopher became a Christian. How? Because he did a bunch of historical investigations? No, because he actually read the Bible. Most of your non-Christian friends have not read the Bible. Most Christians have not read the Bible. Here's the application for you today. If the Bible is self-authenticating, then one of the best ways that you can unveil its divinity is by reading it, teaching it, and preaching it. Let the Bible do the work it was designed to do. And on that score, I certainly find it appropriate to close with a quote from C.H. Spurgeon. Certainly that'll put me in good stead here. Spurgeon said this, and you know it well. Suppose a number of persons were to take it into their heads that they had to defend a lion. I should suggest to them that they should kindly stand back and open the door and merely let the lion out. And that is the application in all of this. You've heard two lectures with lots of academic stuff, but the application for you as teachers and preachers is to let the lion out. Preach, teach, read faithfully the word of God, and it's its own best defense. Thank you very much.